Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life series. This is our third session of a total of nine weeks that we are together. We meet each Wednesday at this time, with the exception to our final session, which is on Tuesday, June the 30th. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Re Relations and a proud UM alumna, and will be the moderator for this series. Today, we have over 730 alumni and friends who've registered for this session from around the world. Thank you for joining us and making this event part of your day and in general for choosing to stay connected with your alma mater in this way. This program has traditionally been in person geared towards our alumni friends audience in the Winnipeg area, but we've been able to expand it to all 145,000 alumni living in 140 countries around the world to participate. We've been able to offer this program free of charge to all alumni and friends, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of one of our affinity partners, IA Financial. Many thanks to them. Delivering learning for life opportunities is a very important role for the University of Manitoba, and we are proud that we are able to showcase so many of our leading professors, researchers, and alumni in this way. So just a few housekeeping details before I introduce our speakers today. You are viewing this webinar in on a YouTube link, uh, and you will be able to see both our presenters and their PowerPoint presentation. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website in the next day or two. You were also sent a link to Slido. The website is www.sli.do with the password 4706. And we are using that website again, like in our other two sessions, for the question and answer portion. So you are welcome to pose your questions at any point over the next hour and a half. And then I, as the moderator, see those questions and we'll make them live. And then at the end, I will be asking those questions verbally to both of our presenters today. I would recommend that either you open a second, uh, a second window in your web browser on your computer, or alternatively, you could use another device to look at Slido on one, and then you can view this on YouTube in another device. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have Dr. Michael Yellowbird and Don McDonald, and the topic is mindfulness meditation. Dr. Yellowbird was appointed as the University of Manitoba's Dean of the Faculty of Social Work in the fall of 2019. He is a celebrated scholar, author, inspirational teacher, and passionate advocate for decolonization, indigenous social innovation and creativity, and institutional and environmental systems change. And Dawn McDonald is, all, is a proud UM alumna uh, with her master's in social work, and she's a fully certified teacher trainer of several contemporary mindfulness-based interventions. So with that, over to you, Dr. Yellowbird and Dawn. Good afternoon, everyone. If it's afternoon where you're at, if, or if not, good morning or good evening, uh, wherever you're at. Uh, it's really a pleasure for, um, for me to be here and for, um, and I think I speak on behalf of uh, my colleague, Don McDonald, that uh, this is a topic that we're both very passionate about. Um, I just want to, um, again, reiterate, you know, the fact that if you, there are questions, you know, we can, we can um, take any questions uh, probably best at the end of the presentation, but um, we're, we're happy um, if there are questions that are, that are just, you know, um, too good to hold back to, um, to share those with us too as well. So um, we, we've put together just a, a very short um, presentation along uh, about mindfulness and meditation and uh, a little bit about the history. We're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, some of the reasons we need mindfulness and meditation today, probably um, more than uh, ever. And also um, what are some of the benefits you, we get from mindfulness? And, and my colleague, Don, will lead us through some practices today as, as we go along. So um, Don, you wanna add anything at this point? Oh, I'm just so grateful to be here with you, Michael. Uh, our history together goes back a few few years now, and I'm so happy that you're here in Winnipeg, Manitoba with us. And uh, thank you to all the alumni for being here. We're just um, honored to share this very timely practice with you. So let me begin by, by saying this. I think one of the things that's always so important interesting to me and compelling is is the history we have as human beings 
and a lot of that history that's been explored and a lot of it that has been unexplored. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, meditation and mindfulness and contemplative behavior. And just to, you know, begin by saying that these practices have been a very important part of human evolution and have been around for tens of thousands of years. Mystics, religious leaders, ascetics, healers, all these different people that have been pursuing enlightenment who have led this life of what they call renunciation from material possessions and physical uh, pleasures, have spent time in isolation, um, concentrating, um, practicing prayers through What is the purpose of life? Many, many people have made, oops, sorry. I don't know what happened to this uh, screen here, but. Ah, there, sorry. Um, many people have made pilgrimages to these very, very sacred places around the world. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna share with you one of my favorite places. And they go there to contemplate, to understanding one's place in the universe. Uh, in my own Have we lost our contact? Yeah, we just lost him. I'll oh. wait for next. I don't know if you want to keep going. Yeah. So for everyone out there, while we're waiting for Michael, maybe we can actually make this uh, real in just allowing yourself to feel your presence here in this moment. So from the contemporary training that I've had, this definition of mindfulness is really that it's our birthright. It's something that's within all of us, but it's also something that we have to access and train. Um, sometimes we've lost contact with the ability to pay attention on purpose in this moment, uh, non-judgmentally, which is a definition that is often used that comes from Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, who created an intervention called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is often credited for the um, burgeoning interest in contemporary mindfulness and uh, long-time mindfulness uh, throughout the world. So more than 40 years ago, he, having had the experience of engaging in very many contemplative traditions, had this idea that perhaps training individuals in healthcare um, people whose medical conditions had them falling through the cracks could uh, engage them in a way in their own health and well-being that they could navigate the potential pitfalls of being in a system that really couldn't help them. So this program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction is also known as participatory medicine. And the idea was to have people wake up to their lives, to wake up to their bodies, to wake up to what their hearts were calling them to, and to wake up to the functioning of the mind. So to build awareness of all of this by regaining our contemplative stance, regaining this capacity for us to actually notice what is happening. So in this moment, right here, right now, inviting you to actually become embodied, be in this body. You know, James Joyce is often uh, credited with saying that Mr. Duffy lived a little distance from his head, 
happen from his body, is the, the quote. So let's see if we can bring our attention right into the physical body in this moment. So feeling your feet on the floor, your cheeks in the seat, the strength of your spine, the head and neck balanced here on the body. And if you're willing and it feels okay to you, feels safe to you, just uh, allow yourself to feel the fact that you're alive and pay attention to how you know it. Maybe you're noticing the warmth of your hands or sounds in the room, this ability to listen or to see. And one of the ways in which we train ourselves to become more uh, present and aware is by the use of the breath. So just discovering this process of breathing that happens, thank goodness, without us having to pay attention. If I had to be responsible for remembering to breathe, I probably would have died a long time ago. But we can both be automatic with the breath and deliberate. So inviting yourself to feel that you're breathing. You might even take a few conscious deep breaths, signaling to the body that you're alive and well. And then just letting the breath return to its own natural rhythm and seeing if you can string one moment of attention on the entirety of one breath. I tell you, it's really, really hard. Because if you're like most people, the majority of the time, we're not actually present to what we're intending to be present to. The mind is wandering. There's a wonderful study done by a group of researchers led by Matt Killingsworth, in which they had iPhones. And at random times during the day, they would prompt people to uh, get a call and they would ask them, what are you doing? Were you aware of what you were doing? And then the really interesting question they asked is, how happy, how satisfied are you with this moment? And what was interesting is that for a majority of the time, nearly half the time, we're not present to what we're doing. We're somewhere else. Oh, you're back. Yeah, when did I, 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 I don't know what happened. I was really sort of going along with my, where, where did you lose me at? We lost you very early in. Um, so yeah. I was just leading a little bit of a brief practice. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, so perfect. Come on in. We hadn't gone past your first slide. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you remember the language, I'm sorry. I don't know what yeah. happened. Dropped it. That's okay. So we had seen the picture of the Grand Canyon, I think, is where you were last speaking of. Yeah, but do you remember the language I was talking about? Because I was reading a lot from a lot of my notes. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, so let me let me just continue. I, I apologize. I'm not sure what happened to how that why the system went down. But um, um, so there there are these, as I mentioned, sacred places, and um, I'm not sure if I should put it back up again because it might lose it. But let me let me see if I can try it again and. Um, because I need to get back to the, uh, gosh, now. Now we are a bit lost. Yeah, you're frozen again, Michael, there. You're just in and out. So maybe you just uh, don't share and see okay. how that goes. Okay, so maybe the slides aren't working. I'm not sure why they're not working. So um, that's unfortunate. Um, so what I, since, since I lost everyone now, I really apologize for that. Um, that's technology for you. I guess that's why we should do these things out in the park someplace where, place where we're physically distanced from one another. So um, Grand Canyon is what I was talking about. I'm not sure where to cut off. So I'm going to just continue. So what I was talking about in terms of contemplation and mindfulness is that 
there are several of these sacred places all over North America that indigenous people call North America Turtle Island. And there's really a lot of evidence that, you know, uh, humans travel to these very sacred places where they go to contemplate, they go to meditate, they go to seek enlightenment, to expose themselves to the environment, to the climate, um, and deny themselves. They do this renunciation of all these things in order to reach this higher level of, um, of enlightenment. And this is something that the Buddha did, the same thing. I mean, he, the Buddha did that, and, um, and Don might want to talk about that too as well, but he um, found, had to find the middle way because he had gotten um, um, so involved in trying to find um, um, enlightenment that he had almost killed himself uh, at least one time. So um, I, I wanted to say this about um, the history. The first actual evidence I was reading about, maybe Don has some um, information too, was, was a carving um, in, in caves in Tibet that were about 8,000 years old where you see these ancient yogis sitting in um, what they call a full, lo full lotus position um, inside the cave. So you know about 8,000 years ago that um, folks were, were, were already doing a meditation, um, you know, in the, uh, formal meditation that part in that part of the world. So meditation mindfulness has been something that all cultures have done. Um, and if we move f a bit forward from that, um, then we get to, we come to the story of the Buddha. Um, um, Don, did you want to say anything about the Buddha? I've got some stuff. Okay. No. Okay. So, uh, so let me, let me just kind of get through this piece here. Cause I think it's, this is something that's always been compelling to me was because it's, you know, Buddha's finding his, his enlightenment as, uh, as he goes along, but, um, Buddha was born, like a lot of these sages, was born into a very um, sacred circumstances. Um, to come see the great um, 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 uh, Seneca leader uh, was born under the star, a, a comet that was, you know, in the 1800s, the 1700s, late 1700s. And uh, there was a sign in the sky, right? Jesus was born under signs, you know, um, all these great leaders. Um, and that's how Tecumseh got his name, the, the panther in the night, because the comet was going across. So are these signs that sort of indicate to people that, you know, someone's born under a sacred sign, that they're probably going to be great leaders in, in life. And that's what happened to the Buddha. So the Buddha, of course, was raised in opulence in a, in a palace. And he, um, um, I'll kind of fast forward, I don't tell the whole story, but he wanted to leave the palace and find out, you know, what life was all about because he had no knowledge of what life was uh, outside the palace was because his father uh, um, forbidden, had, had forbid him to go outside the palace. So um, one day him and his courier went out and he began to see these signs. And in different days he saw these signs, but things that really woke him up to suffering, right? The first uh, person he saw when he went out, he had never seen a sick person before, but he saw a very sick person who was, you know, very, very sick and, and on the age of, you know, on the on the verge of death and so on. And he went back to contemplate that and asked his courier, it says, you know, will this happen to me? And uh, his courier said, yes, of course, you know, um, one day, it won't happen very often, he said, because you have a good diet and you're well taken care of, but we all get sick. And then the next time he went out, he saw an old person, a very, you know, aged person, barely moving along, you know, just with a cane and walking very slowly toothless and, and just really, really um, aged, very aged person. So again, he was struck down with fear and said, oh, wow, I've never seen an old person before because that wasn't allowed in, in the castle where he was or the palace where he was. Again, he asked that question, was told again, yes, you will get old, everyone gets old. And the next, uh, so he contemplated that, became more fearful. The next time he went out from the palace, he snuck out like any teenager sneaking out of the palace, right? He snuck out and he saw a dead person for the first time. And that really moved him, you know. Wow, death. Had never seen death before. Asked that same question, you know, will I die? And again, his courier told him, his you know, assistant told him, yes, of course. You know, we all die, but you'll live a long life because, you know, you're, you know, you're well taken care of. who was sitting by the side of the road 
in a meditative. But in some accounts, when he looked at this person, he could see that this person was lifted of his burdens. And he was that person was smiling, very impoverished, very thin, but very, very, you know, um, free from suffering. And basically he said, that's what I want to be. And from that point on, then he left the palace and then began to uh, seek, like we all do, seeking, right? So he went to different places, different people. And finally um, decided, you know, he had to do this on his own. Wasn't getting the answers, even though he was learning all these advanced techniques and meditation and all these ascetic uh, practices that were leading him to these, these you know, um, transcendent places. He still had suffering in his soul. So then he went, decided he was going to um, seek enlightenment and that he would not cease from doing it until he, was, um, he had achieved it, even if it was his death. Fortunately, uh, he didn't die. He suffered along the way. And he, um, in, the, in the midst of all of this, at the end of all of this, he came up with what um, Buddhists now would, uh, are referred to as the Four Noble Truths. And I'll just sort of paraphrase them very quickly. That, you know, we suffer as human beings. No matter if we live a quiet life or we live a very hard, difficult life with a lot of overstimulation, we suffer. There is suffering that exists. And, you know, they, uh, we're, we're born, we suffer, you know, we, until we come into the world and when we leave, we're suffering going out of the world. And there is a source of suffering. The source of suffering, according to some people who write the Buddha, are two things. One is the attachment to things that we're going to lose in our life. You know, people are going to die. We're going to get old. We're going to, you know, we're going to lose things. And the other one is aversion, our dislike or distaste for things. We don't, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this person. I don't like that situation. Those causes us suffering, right? And these are a couple of things that the Buddha talked about. I'm, I'm simplifying it, you know. So I know my colleague Dawn, is, she's a scholar in this area, so I'm just kind of picking my way through it. Uh, the one I, I really like um, um, that I think holds so much promise is that uh, the third noble truth is freedom from suffering. Freedom from suffering is available in this lifetime, right? And how is it available? Through the practice of what the Buddha called the Eightfold Path, right? The right understanding of life, the right, under, the right thoughts, the right speech, the right conduct, the right means to live, you know, not oppressing others or even animals you know, or, or serving liquor and alcohol to people, making, causing pain in people's lives, the right mindfulness, being mindful of things, the right concentration, you know, and finally the right effort are the eightfold path. And so these are the things that, that the Buddha that I came up with that a lot of people uh, spend a lifetime studying and just practicing um, to try, just to try to get those things right. So that's kind of like the origin of mindfulness and the origin of, of uh, meditation in a very sort of condensed way. Um, Don, do you have anything to add? I think one of the things that I love most about um, uh, the, the teachings that are the origination of all of these contemporary expressions is that uh, the invitation not to trust anything we say, but to actually engage and see what's true for you too. So although we outline the Eightfold Noble Path or um, anything that we describe, the Buddha always said, uh, do your own experiments, live into your own truth, discover for yourself how meaningful this can be. So that's part of what uh, Michael and I are gonna be talking about is how to actually engage in a way that allows your inherent nature to be revealed to you so that you live the truth and authenticity of your own life. That's part of what mindfulness really is. Great, wonderful. So, um, so I thought maybe, um, I know you were leading a practice. 
So do you want to finish that practice? Let's finish. I would love to. So I was uh, just telling you about uh, this Matt Killingsworth study about um, pain, you know, how to, how often our minds are actually not where we are and how often we are distracted by perception and perception that isn't often what we've chosen. Uh, the filters by which we see. So I had just invited you into your own body and to experience your aliveness. So let's resume that experience by just uh, once again feeling the weight of your body wherever you're sitting or lying or standing. To experience your feet on the floor, your cheeks in the seat, the strength of your spine, And um, I love this phrase, it's just experiencing your inherent dig dignity. Experiencing your inherent dignity. And then entering in, like really discovering the experience of your breath in this moment, be it an in-breath, or an out breath. And as I said before, it's a, it's a remarkable feat to be able to stay, to harness your attention, to gather your attention and have it rest on this experience of your breathing. But there's a certain freedom that comes when we do. But maybe for you, like for me, like for almost every human being, your mind has wandered. Maybe even a hundred times since uh, we began. And so the practice is actually to make a choice breath. Just this breath. And this one. And as Michael was naming the Eightfold Path, it's, it's often called the middle way, a way in which we don't strive too hard to uh, have perfection, which is um, one of the things that so many of us struggle with, the stress of striving. So if you find yourself striving to hang on to the experience of breathing, just let it go. Notice that your mind may have wandered and you can note where your mind alighted to. And then when you're ready, just come back to being here. Just this, only this, just for right now. And then as you're ready, letting go of your attention on this breath. And as adult learners, we don't just uh, learn by experiencing something, we learn by reflecting on experiencing something. And so just take a moment to notice what is the quality of the body in this moment? What's the quality of the experience of emotion? And what's the quality of the mind having spent just a few moments narrowing the focus of your attention, concentrating, if you will, on experiencing your aliveness? And then I'm going to turn it right back over to you, Michael. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Don. It's very You're welcome. It's very uh, satisfying. I always really appreciate the way Don sort of leads us through these um, these uh, practices. He's got such a calming voice and uh, so knowledgeable about the um, 
what the process is. So um, the, the next section, you know, after we talked about what mindful, sort of kind of how long it's been around is in history and how people have contemplated, you know, for thousands of years and gone to these on these pilgrimages and have, you know, in their own languages, in their own sort of cultures, these different ways they do those things. Um, the, the next uh, part of the conversation then is, why don't we all feel enlightened right now? What's all this about the stress in our lives, right? And um, I think it's, you know, so important to begin to really investigate that, right? We, we, can, we can talk about that a bit and say, well, you know, these are things that, um, that exist in our lives. I've got my notes here, sorry. Um, and these are some of the reasons that, you know, we, we do have things like stress. Um, well, stress is actually normal, right? It's, it's, a, it's a, an anxiety and depression. But probably not for a long time have we had, as large societies, such high levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, has declared, you know, anxiety and depression, you know, to be pandemics. COVID-19 is not your first pandemic. Your first pandemic is the anxiety and the depression on all the mood disorders that come from living in first world um, circumstances. All the demands, all the noise, all the excess um, um, stimulation that we get. Um, we live um, um, in an environment, you know, with all the stimulation all the news, the negative stories, the negative communication create fear, uncertainty. They make us angry. They make us resentful. Um, and we're overloaded. All we have to do is look at a billboard and it triggers that overload and that fear. That's the way the brain works. The brain is constantly in a, in a, in a um, condition of surveillance in order to stay safe. It's looking for threats, right? That's how we evolved. We evolved to see beauty, but we all evolved to see a lot of the threats and dangers that exist. Um, so what happens when we live in a world with all this anxiety, all this overstimulation, all this bad news? Well, then it does create the anxiety. What it does is it triggers in our body the need to raise our levels of uh, neurochemicals like um, cortisol which is an adrenaline-like factor that helps us run from the danger and escape from the danger. If you're sitting in the car driving along and you see a sign that doesn't support your political ideology or, or, or it's offensive to you or something that you would never do and it, it triggers anger or frustration or, or it can, can trigger, trigger um, you know, uh, fear, then naturally your cortisol levels are going to go up. You know, they're going up because they're, they want you to get away from danger, right? And it zaps your energy once your cortisol levels go up and they stay up. It zaps your energy. And, and you can take a look at that in society today, at first world societies. First world societies have such a problem with uh, what we call um, mismatched diseases, like diabetes, like heart disease and cancers, like hypertension and depression and anxiety, those are all these mismatched diseases. Well, how do, how do we get mismatched diseases? Well, I'll tell you about, about mismatch in just a second, but how we get them is that once we're in the state of shock or fear or we're running or stressed, the first thing we wanna do after our cortisol levels stay high for too long is we need to replace that energy that's been used. It's like we haven't run a 100 meter dash away from the bear, we're running 100, kilometer dash away from the bear. And that takes a lot of energy and calories. So the first thing the body and brain does is that it goes into the mode where it says, give me calorie dense foods. Give me French fries and fat and fried foods and sugary drinks. And pretty soon we have a health crisis on our hands. Now that's just not here in Canada or the United States or North America. This is all around the world. And that's what we do. We, we, we go to that. And that's our first place. And that's where things like mindful eating come into play, right? Or getting in touch with your body. 
right? So let me tell you a little bit about mismatched diseases, then we'll kind of go around, go on from this, from the uh, stress stressors that are there. I'm just trying to give you some uh, important information about that. So we know that most of us, our ancestors, who were hunter-gatherers or traditional horticulture uh, people, who before big farming and living in cities, lived in places for millions of years that were where they depended upon food sources that were, you know, kind of hit and miss, but they much healthier foods and they drank only things like water, right? They were in much, much better physical and emotional um, health than we are today. So when we move from those places, and don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about an idyllic place where people didn't starve. They did. They starved to death. They had famines and starvation. But when disease or when, when foods were, when there was enough food, they didn't hoard food. They ate the food, maybe had feast, and then they saved the foods, and then they learned how to sort of um, um, get their food and sort of uh, um, spread it out through longer periods of time. So we evolved to fast too as well. And that's why all the mystics that have ever fasted, if you look at, if you look at um, the Buddha, look at Jesus, look at all these people that are seeking enlightenment. Fasting has been really part of our ceremonial life. All people, doesn't matter if you're Muslim or Christian or uh, if you're you know, uh, non-denominational or whatever, fasting is something that all people have done. So what are mismatched diseases? Um, this is from Daniel Lieberman, who was an evolutionary uh, biologist at Harvard University. I was uh, just finished an article and I was citing him. He says that mismatched diseases occur because our bodies are poorly or inadequately adapted to the environment in which we now live. Here's an example he gives. Would be eating large amounts of sugar or being very physically inactive. Both of those lead to problems like diabetes and heart disease, and they make us sick. So mismatched diseases are diseases that are more modern in the sense that they're more prevalent or even novel or more severe because we don't live the way that our bodies are adapted to. So if you go back to the Buddha and you go back to all these people that were a few thousand years ago before the advent of farming and living in big cities, our DNA and our genes, we have evolved to have genes that we need to contemplate. We have the genetic as well as the neurobiological tools and our, our, our uh, organs in our brain to engage in um, meditative practices like prayer, like gazing at the stars for hours, like becoming entranced by the fire. And, and uh, we have the mechanisms that help us to benefit in so many ways in our mental and physical health. So when we live in, in the modern world with these diseases, then when we eat fatty calories and these rich foods, we don't, over, no, don't just overeat, we gain weight, we get depressed, and then we end up with a disease. And then we're going to the doctor who rarely prescribes for us to do meditation or go on a pilgrimage or sit out there and gaze at the stars or these kinds of things like our ancestors did as a function of our healing, right? And so this is kind of what we're talking about is mindfulness and meditation has a much larger context Sitting is great. Walking mindfulness is great. And um, we know that sometimes uh, some definitions of mindfulness say that we're, we pay attention on purpose. Um, but I, I also say that we, we pay attention accidentally when we see something just beautiful, right? It's not that we're going to, and that's the way we've evolved as humans. We don't have to say, well, I'm going to pay attention on purpose every morning to do my meditation. Some, if you, if so, all of a sudden something moves you and you're paying attention, that could be an accidental, you know, way of being mindful. But just stay with it, you know, and, and absorb it. The music, the sound, the sight, the formations, whatever it is. And this is how we combat the diseases of um, civilization. We call the mismatched diseases. So, um, Don, do you want to add anything? Thank you, Michael. I love that you're uh, bringing in this topic of savoring experience, right? Um, but 
there was a opportunity where we can live our whole life and forget to look at the stars, right? And so this, it's, it almost has to be deliberate. We have to actually include it in our purview because when the, the drive that we've had to be successful, to acquire, to, to do things in our lives can, can also uh, be um, an impediment to living life fully. And so this idea to, to both concentrate our attention and then what Michael's talking about, opening up to the wonder of the world, it's, it, it feels silly to say that we have to actually intentionally do that. But for many people in Western society, we've actually forgotten to be uh, attuned to wonder. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Well, um, maybe it might be a, a, a great time to do another meditation where um, maybe a visualization about... Um, um, I'll see if I can bring up the Grand Canyon again. And maybe you want to lead us through a visualization, um, Don. Uh, um, let's see if I can do this. Um, let's see if I can do this here. Share my screen. Okay. So while Michael's looking for his screen, I'm just going to... Uh, preface this practice by talking about the importance of actually nourishing ourselves, especially in the face of fear. And uh, this pandemic has really awakened fear for many of us. It's an unprecedented experience in our lifetimes for many of us. And you might have heightened levels of cortisol, I know, and adrenaline and all the fear hormones that have been released. And so to counterbalance that, I'm going to invite you into a, a meditative uh, experience that will um, have us rest in something that's inspiring. So... Can you see that? I'm sorry, can you see yeah, that? Screen, Don? Okay. That, that's beautiful. So, Michael, I might just invite you to mute yourself for a little bit so that we don't get some feedback. Oops, you changed the slide. There we go. I'm not sure. About, can you mute me? Yes. You're there, you're good, it's perfect. So using the power of your mind right now, if you're willing, establishing yourself once again in the physical body. So feeling yourself here. Inviting you to recall a person or a place, or maybe even a four-legged creature in whose company you have felt capable of being fully yourself. So Michael's trying to eliminate that um, label so that we can see the picture itself. So just let your mind's eye bring that situation to mind. a place in which uh, there is a sacred connection, a connection to the wonder. And allow yourself to um, have as many details as possible. Perhaps it's with a trusted mentor or friend. So imagining yourself sharing space with this person. You might even notice a natural smile coming to your mind. Or maybe it's a vista like the Grand Canyon or a wide open prairie field. There's a place I know of near here, up near Riding Mountain, where in the summer the canola and the flax in the sky all meet. Just allowing yourself to feel that savoring, that interconnection, how these moments of connection live in our bones in a certain sort of way. 
And allow yourself to actually breathe that in with this next breath. And of course, as we know, more than half the time, even when we intentionally choose to remember something or think about something or be present to something, the mind will wander. And so do we just refresh our aim? Allow yourself once again to recall this experience of freedom, of appreciation, of beauty, So sometimes uh, some of my teachers have talked about um, maybe there is no destination for enlightenment as a place, but rather a series of moments where you feel enlightened. And if we can string together a few of those moments, what a precious gift that is. So from this uh, memory of feeling freedom, just allowing yourself to breathe this in. And if you're willing, on your out breath, imagine sharing that freedom with everyone around you. And we can experiment with offering that wish uh, for freedom as widely as you care to in this moment. May those we love, those we know, those we have not yet met, the earth, the sky, all beings everywhere experience this freedom. And then as this short practice begins to draw to a close, letting go of the image. And once again, just dropping into the experience of sitting here, the wholeness of your body, from the tips of your toes to the top of your head, the sides of your body, the front, the back. Recognizing that even if there are some parts missing or parts added or parts not functioning the way you'd like them to, that there's more right with you than wrong with you in this moment. And then as you feel ready, perhaps on your next out breath, if your eyes have been closed, opening them. Michael, maybe you'll talk a little bit about what happens in the brain as we uh, move towards meditation, or the results of meditation. Talk a bit about, you know, the um, what is what is mindfulness? And I think it's really important to remember that, you know, it's not only being aware of the present moment, but we are connected and influenced by a natural world we have a genetic past of our ancestors that still operates in us today. And that's where the mismatched diseases come from. Sometimes that's where the fears come from. Sometimes it's where the courage comes from. Sometimes where that, that's where the inability to metabolize caffeine comes from, and that which, which is a situation I have um, uh, from my ancestors. Um, so I don't drink too much coffee. All these things affect us. We have inside of us living to a human microbiome, a uh, whole great circle of life that is also part of our health that we have to be aware of and be mindful that, you know, we live in all these different um, concentric circles that are connected to one another. And um, mindfulness is just really this quality or state of being mindful. And uh, what uh, Don is being talking about is we're maintaining a non-judgmental state of awareness, thoughts, emotions, experiences on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Also a state of awareness. 
I also say number three, I didn't write it down here though, is it's also um, mindfulness can be a very judgmental state. It also can be, um, um, doesn't have to be um, on purpose. It can happen spontaneously. And um, so it, it really, really sort of changes. Don, can you see the slides? I'm sorry. Hello? Darn it. Yes, I can. No, oh, you're okay. good. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. So I thought, when you didn't answer it, I thought, oh, I lost him again. Okay. So I'm going to continue to go on. Um, meditation um, is actual the practice of mindfulness, right? Concentrating on, on the word, on the practice, the focus on the sound or phrase, visualization, like we just did, movement, any of these kinds of things uh, that we do um, and concentrate on doing them. Uh, increase our awareness and enhance our um, um, uh, spiritual and personal growth, promote rela relaxation and so on. These are just, a, it's another sort of little model that I did that are the pieces, not judging the experience. And sometimes I put, I put a slasher there saying judging it, yeah, too. And uh, attachment, non-attachment, paying attention, acceptance, present moment awareness are all sort of part of so the, the basic beginning of mindfulness. As you see in the corners there, the, the little skeleton and the green is kind of what we call the distraction demons. Don't pay attention, you know, lose your concentration, lose your focus. You know, hit your thumb with the with the hammer, right? Or some that kind of thing. So um, uh, th this is Thich Nhat Hanh, who is uh, he was like 93 years old now. He's a Buddhist uh, monk, um, Vietnamese, uh, but also, um, a very, very eminent uh, uh, scholar and, and teacher of mindfulness and all the different kinds of mindfulness practices that, that uh, are possible to do. Everything from sitting to uh, you know, loving kindness down there and, and uh, resilience practices and so on. A lot of research that shows um, what mindfulness is helpful for, attention, compassion, regulating our emotions, calming us, There's a lot of good research evidence base. It also helps us preserve the aging brain, you know, keeps the, the um, gray matter, white matter, you know, um, in good abundance, reduces, you know, the me center of the brain. It helps us be we. Good for, it's much better than uh, in many instances uh, than antidepressants. Leads to, as we were talking, um, Don mentioned earlier about the growth of, of gray matter and white matter in the brain. Just a few days of training improves concentration, reduces anxiety and social anxiety, can help with addictions. So I'm going to sort of scroll through these uh, parts too because we only have an half, uh, hour and a half today and just talk a little bit about the neurobiology of mindfulness. That through a lot of investigation, we know that very particular parts of the brain and the body are really uh, affected. Structures change, function changes in the brain um, and, and, and during different meditative states. And this is really a good thing, really a, a wonderful thing. So what we had mentioned earlier is that changes happen very fast. Only after 11 hours of, of mindfulness practice and training, um, we get positive growth in our, in our uh, white matter in the brain, which produces the connectivity between the brain, how the brain talks to itself, right? How it communicates its feelings, its emotions, its thinking, its fears, its logic, its rationalization, its prayer, its, you know, and anything that you do, right? Even touching heat or any of those kinds of things. This is why it's so important for those of us who are putting on um, those years is that it's, it's, it's a very, very well-tested, you know, um, practice, a lot of evidence base. Um, actually, there is uh, some research indicating, too, that the more and more we practice, the greater and greater not only uh, brain uh, volume matter that we get, but we also develop more neurons uh, in, in, a, uh, uh, in a practice, not a practice, but in, in a, as a result of uh, what they call neurogenesis, right? We grow more neurons. Very, very important and protective for neurodegenerative diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's. If you have what they call uh, 
neuronal um, um, growth and you have um, uh, what they call cognitive reserve because you have more growth, chances are you're, you know, uh, uh, you're going to do much better as you get older. Uh, and that's been shown um, in a number of different kinds of uh, studies now. Um, uh, more practice is even better. Uh, 45 minutes of practice per day for eight weeks changes major brain structures associated with memory, sense of self, empathy, and stress, Short, both short and long-term memory. Um, and that's a good thing. Now, these are just very short studies. Imagine if we were doing it every day past eight weeks for the rest of our lives. We would have such big gains and such great benefits. Um, other parts, like the insula part of the brain, is a side. One up on the left, you're looking at the screen, is the uh, activated insula. The next picture to the to its um, to the right of it is the insula from the back. The insula, there are two of them, and then the, the other one is the top down. As you see the activation there, what it is is that uh, the insula mediates conflict in the body but also is scanning the body for the physiological state. How am I feeling? You know, and a lot of times we, we're not feeling well. You know, uh, we could, you know, uh, if we're getting a disease or an illness, we don't pay attention to it. Um, this kind of um, practice helps us uh, be more in touch with the physiological changes and states in the body. Also controls mental emotions and the regulation of the body's balance, you know, heat balance, emotional balance. Uh, able enables one to control negative emotions, right? I'm talking about that very early on, that part you didn't hear as I fell offline. There's also in this particular slide the connections you see here between the parietal kind of in the kind of the uh, tan up in the top to the right, you know, IGF down to it's called top-down modulation modulation because it starts with the parietal lobe. Parietal lobe is sort of uh, um, connecting, you know, and then connecting all the way down to the seeing part, the occipital lobe. That's something we don't have to be too concerned about now because we don't have enough time to talk about it. But if you see this slide, um, those who, people who do a lot of meditation have an enhanced ability to perceive the emotional mental state of others. In fact, what it means is that, you know, your level of mo emotional intelligence goes up and your mental intelligence of others goes up, right? You're, you're better at reading people. And this is very, very important for all of our ancestors at one time when we lived in villages and tribes all over the world, was that we didn't need social workers. Anybody in the village had a high level of uh, uh, temporal parietal junction activation because of a lot of contemplative practices. So they could see if someone was sort of skidding off the road early on or something was, someone was feeling depressed or suicidal or anxiety ridden. Right, because people had trained themselves to have this high level of mental intelligence and emotional intelligence about other people. Today, it's hard to read others. We don't, you know, we make a lot of mistakes sometimes when we try to read other folks. The last uh, chart I'll show you is this brainwave graph, and uh, the people that are that are meditating, you know, kind of end up in the alpha wave level, very relaxed, deepening into meditation, and. Um, as we see the modulation in the brain, we know that anyone who reaches this level and has a lot of training is that for most of us who don't do meditation, when we reach an alpha level, this nice kind of roll there um, uh, of, of brain waves, then we get tired and fall asleep. But if you can imagine a person that's trained uh, themselves in doing meditation for long periods of time and learned how to calm down these brain waves, through different kinds of practices, then 24 seven, a person could be wide awake, very alert, but the brain waves would be in a very, very nice relaxed state and just sort of just kind of modulating along. If you go up higher, when you see the beta waves, a lot of us are sort of in that level until we go to bed, which is why we can't go to sleep very much. The gamma waves are, um, this is kind of a mis, sort of misnaming of a hyperwave or a, a gamma wave because a gamma wave has a couple of functions. The one function is that we know that um, meditators who have meditated like 40,000 hours in their lifetime can re achieve a gamma wave um, um, uh, wave uh, um, modulation. And really what that means in terms of when you look at the science of that is that it puts the brain in a state of maximal sensitivity. The brain is just so 
sensitive to things that are going on around it. The other thing it does to the brain too is that at that level, and I'm talking about meditation, I'm talking about mindfulness, when you become that skilled, is that the brain is using little or no power. So brain fatigue um, is something that, you know, is not an issue like it would be if um, unless you were in a beta wave. So these are things that really change um, when we begin to do um, a mindfulness practices as we get in deeper and deeper into that. And this is why from a neurological, neurobiological perspective, that it's so good for our brains and our body. So I'm just going to end the show there and go back to go back to the, um, to everyone here. So, Michael, I just love that you um, ended on that experiment with ch checking the brain waves, especially with experienced meditators. And I love the story of when they actually did this study. Um, they uh, recruited monks who had been practicing for so long mm -hmm. and they put the brain, the uh, sensors on their heads and the monks all started to laugh uh, because if you don't hear the word heartfulness when you're saying mindfulness, then your definition is not complete because they thought that the scientists should put the sensors on their heart, not on their heads. <laughs> so mindfulness also has this quality of deep care and compassion uh, in the world and it isn't just about our cognitive selves so i think we're gonna see some kinds of questions now yeah so um ready for any questions you have so thank you very much um, we have just one question right now. I'm hoping some more will come in, but this is a, this is a really interesting one. It's, could you please speak about the criticism of mindfulness without ethics? This is sometimes called make mindfulness. Yeah. Well, maybe I can I can sort of speak for um, for uh, just my part. And I know Don has thought about this a lot. Um, I, I don't actually. Um, um, do mindfulness um, like kind of mainstream mindfulness. Um, um, I, I sort of, I'm, I'm much more leaning toward traditional indigenous mindfulness practices, contemplative practices. Um, but I know it has the, the same effect. Um, but in, in my, my worldview, I know that um, people don't um, reach these levels to be teachers at all um, unless the person has sort of lived life on my my reserve back in the states, um, that's pretty clear. People, spiritual leaders are not young people necessarily. That's very rare. Um, and uh, in order to learn this, you become an apprentice to someone that teaches uh, uh, this sort of thing. So um, that's kind of from the the standpoint. And I think that's why when you see indigenous people like First Nation people, um, it's it's kind of a it's it's fairly closed yet. You can go to the ceremonies and you can you know, engage in indigenous mindfulness, but to become a practitioner requires a long, hard, arduous journey of learning. And then, of course, uh, along the way, you have to gain the respect. You have to put in the miles. You have to do all these kinds of things. So um, I, I can I can see that you know what you're uh, what the uh, question is talking about. Because last thing I'll say about it real quickly is uh, a lot of people have done the same with indigenous mindfulness. Is, is they've taken sweat lodges, for example, and run sweat lodges and, um, you know, charge money for sweat lodges. And pretty soon they're running these sweat lodges. And, you know, it's a very sacred, you know, kind of meditative practice um, for a lot of indigenous people. So there's a lot of controversy around that, too, as well. So I'll, I'll just say that much. And Dawn, I'm sure she can add um, a lot. So. Yeah, I'm so grateful for this question. You know, Ron Purser has written a lot about the concept of mindfulness and the ways in which mindfulness has uh, proliferated in the world. And much like anything, you know, we're, we're human. And so we're uh, tempted to be, to exploit things um, out of greed, uh, sometimes out of delusion. Um, and also, you know, the third factor, which we always talk about is, is, um, um, not not respecting another culture. And so this uh, 
we as mindfulness, contemporary mindfulness teachers in the world have developed something called an international integrity network, uh, where we've actually spent some good quality time considering what is, what is it that constitutes good practice. So there are some good practice guidelines that come out of the UK. Um, I don't think mindfulness itself can actually be uh, exploited because it is an inherent human quality. But much like anything, I just recommend to people that they take a good long look at what the teacher is offering, to take a good long look at the kinds of training that Michael's referring to, a history of training. Um, you know, I feel like a neophyte and I've only been teaching for 20 years. Uh, you know, it, it, it's never over. And so if somebody takes a weekend course and then is offering you mindfulness training, much like the Buddha initially um, invited is like experiment for yourself. Really uh, take the practices into your heart. See what benefits uh, are happening for you. Um, but some of the criticism is unfounded. Some of the criticism is really unfounded and some of it isn't. So trust your own intuition, trust your own awakening, trust your own moments of enlightenment or enlightening moments. Thank you for that question. Well, we have more questions now. <laughs> they started to roll in. Um, okay, another one is, the lack of mindfulness is often considered to be a symptom of people with aut autism. Could you speak to the issue? So, Michael, I don't know if you have um, anything to talk about, like, research-wise. I, I feel like I can speak to... Um, have seen some work, some work at uh, with people with autism, including a grandson. <laughs> and uh, there's much written about both a lack of mindfulness, a lack of attention, or over in, over attention. And so, one of the um, ways in which mindfulness is defined is uh, as an lack of mindfulness isn't mindlessness, but also an over identification with something. And so on occasion, people become over-identified with a particular experience. But from an academic point of view, I can't really comment on the research. Michael, are you familiar with this? I am not familiar with mindfulness and, and, and autism. I'm more familiar with uh, autism and diet, you know, because um, I do a lot of work in, in um, uh, microbiome science and also um, Autism, uh, a lot of people would argue, uh, I know this is not answering directly your question, but a lot of uh, uh, evolutionary um, folks um, talk about autism being um, one of those diseases of civilization, um, just like heart disease would be, um, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's the, uh, you know, we, many of us have genes that, that express for many different kinds of things, right? Um, for different kinds of conditions. One condition could be maybe autism. One condition could be, you know, uh, geoblastoma for brain cancer. Another one could be for um, long life expectancy, or uh, one can be for, you know, the inability to, um, to uh, as I said, me metabolize caffeine. So uh, I look at the body as a very dynamic system, very dynamic. Um, and um, what I've what I, I, I've got one graduate student, PhD student now, who's uh, working on a dissertation um, on uh, diet and, and autism. Um, not here, but back in the States. And so um, she's done some of that work around there, and I've, I've kind of done some of the work around there too. So it, it um, in a sense, is, you know, um, like a lot of things, you know, we may have the, the, the genetic um, um, variants for it, whatever the disease may be, but it may be that, food, stress, the, the, the lack of, um, you know, um, something or a change in environment may activate a condition like autism. So I, that's, that's about as much as I know about autism. I don't know um, how or why it could be um, related to, um, um, I guess, the, the, uh, 
shutting down of the brain uh, or, and the uh, the inability to to be mindful. I'm not sure. It would be an interesting question, though. But thank you for that question. Um, in, uh, in a similar vein, another question is, I imagine that mindfulness and meditation could be useful for people with ADHD. Have there been any studies relating to this? You want to take that, Don? Um, my apologies. I, uh, right now I'm not remembering the authors, but definitely this uh, training in attention has been a very helpful situation for people who have um, challenges with paying attention. In particular, so I'm going to go back to the autism question in a little bit. So there was a there was a study that's floating into the back of my mind in which uh, individuals who had um, hyper an ability to not pay attention and also uh, a great deal of trouble with emotion regulation were trained in mindfulness of the body. In particular, they were trained in a particular kind of intervention that's called soles of the feet, in which uh, when standing, they began to become familiar with the experience of knowing the sensations of their feet in their socks, in their shoes on the ground. And that particular training in that intervention reduced their emotional volatility sufficiently enough that they actually were able to move from institutionalized living into community living. So this ability to um, notice the tendency to uh, uh, have uh, visceral experiences of emotion and be able to regulate them through uh, attention in the body has been super helpful for individuals. Yeah, and, and just to add to that too, a, a number of people, um, I have to dig out the, the work now, but a number of people have actually written about, you know, um, all the diagnosis uh, the, uh, the, um, that, that come from uh, the DSM, whatever version it is these days. Um, a number of them now are, are looking at um, rather than autism or rather than, you know, labeling someone with hyperactivity disorder. Uh, what, what some folks are beginning to uh, label it with is uh, uh, movement um, or environmental uh, deficit disorder, meaning that people, are, that children are not outside enough, um, uh, um, which begins to really change the way that their brain works. And how, and we know, we've known these for years that, uh, that little kids that play and they run and they balance, um, have these neuronal growth spurts in their brain when they're outside. These are things that we've known for years, um, looking at uh, animal models, then looking at children models when you do uh, scans of kids uh, during their developmental stages. So again, that's why I say that um, <laughs> I haven't looked at um, um, like ADHD in that, in that context myself, but I have read <laughs> or a number of scholars have talked about it now more in a sense of rather than, you know, some kind of attention deficit disorder, it's more of an environmental or um, 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 outdoor, you know, uh, environment um, disorder, you know, that, that kids aren't getting enough to play time and stuff, which makes sense when you start looking at the, um, how the brain uh, works and how, how it grows and when it grows and that sort of thing. So the lack of stimulation um, really creates a lot of issues in terms of um, brain growth and uh, neuronal uh, growth. So, Okay, another question. Does it concern you that mindfulness is used synonymously with awareness in reference to things that have nothing to do with the concept? I, I Maybe I could just say for me, I don't, I mean... Um, I don't see a difference, first of all, between awareness and mindfulness. You know, it's, it's kind of one and the same thing in many ways. It's just context and, and you know, um, you know, when a person is doing kind of awareness training, which a lot of people call it, they don't even call it mindfulness training or concentration training. Um, you know, that's done in other contexts, right? It's done in contexts where, you know, um, people aren't actually uh, doing uh, mindfulness per se practice, but they're they're focusing on on achieving a certain kind of level of competence by paying attention to um, whatever they're doing, you know, whether it's neurosurgery or whether it's, um, you know, um, people who are engaging in, um, in um, 
you know, diffusing situations. You know, they're paying attention to several things at once. Person's body language, facial expression, the, the time of the day when they begin to diffuse a dangerous situation. So it's never called mindfulness there. It's all, it's all about, you know, awareness of the, of the situation. So, um, I, I, so I think they're one and the same. So. <coughs> okay, great. Um, do you, uh, this question is from a school social worker who's developing a back to school plan. The question mm -hmm. is, do you have any specific recommendations for children returning to school? It's just such a great initiative, the Mindfulness in Schools initiative. Oh, you know, I think one of the things that I really believe that mindfulness training can do for, for us as individuals when we're in these situations is to really begin to pay attention to what's going to be needed. Right, to, to notice both um, in, a, in a funneled way and in a broader way what um, the children are going to need as they return to school. I, I'm, you know, I've been thinking about the implications of this pandemic on our children and our health systems and all of it. And there's some really great lessons that may be emerging about the kinds of ways in which we need to um, decolonize the structures that have been existing and how we might be able to pay attention to what smaller class sizes might be doing for us. Um, what will the children need? How will we mitigate the uh, emotional implications? So you as a teacher creating the scenario for your classroom, you know, when, when we talk about the difference between awareness and mindfulness. Mindfulness is the awareness that arises when we actually have an open ability to look at all of the factors that need to be present for the young people emerging. And I know Michael has so much more in his decolonizing mindfulness work that uh, will be contributing to these um, inevitable and beautiful evolution of our culture. So, so um, thank you, Donna. I, and I want to just sort of add a bit to that. Um, I was a teacher's aide years ago, years ago, and um, I was a kid. Miyagi was once a child too. So, um, one of the things I know about the science of exercise is that we should never isolate mindfulness practice as something that kids do sitting right, in the classroom. I think kids coming back to school, I always, like with my own children, you know, it's kind of like um, um, uh, Cesar in Milan, if you've ever heard of him, he's, you know, he's a, trains these, trains, he's a dog trainer. But I think about it, my own kids when they were little, and I've got little kids now, um, I always think discipline, exercise, and then love, right? Uh, but for kids, I think coming back to school, I, I, I really believe that you know, play, 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 play. Those things are so critical, so critical. If you want to do these kids a favor, um, in my estimation, even though I have a, this great sort of um, belief in mindfulness, do not sit them in a chair and make them start practicing mindfulness practices first thing, first day. The first thing they need is to do is they need to exercise and play, reacquaint themselves with one another in the ground, in the, in the, in the uh, safety of the place. They need to run. They need to laugh. Um, they need to move. Uh, I'll, rec I'll recommend a reading to you. It's called Spark. It's written by this guy, John Rately, who is an MD, who wrote this, wrote this great book back in 2013. I think that's a new, I think that's a new edition of it. It's, it's called The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain. Um, I don't know if Rately says this. But I'm not. I remember I'd have to find the resource, the source again. But it's mindfulness is even more. It's even uh, from a um, neurological point of view. It's even more uh, effective when someone goes on a nice long run or a run and then comes back and relaxes for a while and then sits and goes into a meditative, uh, um, you know, um, uh, practice by sitting 
and uh, focusing on your breath. Why does that work? Well, because what science tells us is that with children, they need to play. And if they have a good, they have good feelings coming out of that play, they sit down and they meditate on that good feeling, they're going to keep it the rest of the day because they preserve those neurons of fun in the brain. I'm just calling it that, right? That's what I call it, the neurons of play, the neurons of fun. But you can think holistically. I always think holistically, right? Mindfulness sitting practice or even walking practice is one thing. But in order for the kids to get the dopamine levels up, the serotonin levels up, and to be expressing, you know, norepinephrine at a healthy level so their alertness is all about fun and games rather than fear, they've got to run. They've got to play. Once they do that, the exercise, then you give them the love of sitting mindfulness so that they learn how to bring that all back to the center, right? That's that's what I recommend. That's what I tell people because I, you know, um, that's just the way I am. I'm a runner. I've I've been a meditator for over 45 years. I've been a runner longer than that. And um, when I saw the science about how running, you know, increases neurogenesis. And then how you sit after helps preserve the, the brains that you've grown. There you go. It's all free, right? You make a better brain. You make a better kid. You make a, a better situation and so on. So, But I really recommend reading the book Spark, the Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain by John Rately. Okay, another question in a similar vein is what can individuals and organizations do specifically to bring mindfulness back into the mainstream education and healthcare system? Don? Hmm. So as a co-founder of something called the Compassion Project, which is an innovative organizational change and development um, initiative designed to reacquaint us, to re reacquaint healthcare providers with their inherent ability to be mindful. Uh, I think that it, it's very important for us to, to create the conditions for us to have solid reflection on any process that we're engaging in. And so this uh, broadening our awareness, broadening the capacity, having conversations at all levels of an organization, uh, including the people that we serve, to really begin to listen to the voices and to not always um, draw upon experts as the decision makers. I think this is a very fundamental experience that we need to get back to community in our organizations. And uh, that's why I think Michael and I are both so passionate about bringing um, a Center for Mindful Decolonization and Reconciliation to the University of Manitoba. This capacity that each of us has to actually pause to see what's forming our thoughts. You know, mindfulness has four foundations. Foundations of the body, foundations of what we turn towards and turn against, mm -hmm. mindfulness of thoughts and emotions and how they're formed and how they affect how we perceive. And then mindfulness of the ultimate teachings, the, the, the universal teachings of connection and interconnection. Uh, the world needs this right now. And if there's ever been a time in which we've been more aware of the interconnectedness of all things, it's been through this pandemic. And so, as I was saying earlier to the teacher about paying attention to the lessons that are emerging from this crisis in our world and where it is that we may be, have been going astray and what we need to do to begin to take care of ourselves, the future generations and the earth itself is to create the conditions for us to actually hear each other's voices and not discount each other's experiences. Michael? Yeah, so let me add something too, because um, I, I kind of a pragmatic person in many ways. Um, first thing you, you want to do is tell them you can get a grant. You know, get a grant. It's something that has enough evidence base if you put together a program in the school. Um, it doesn't have to be anything like you know it's huge or anything, but you know it'll 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 bring in some resources there. Second thing is bring in the evidence. Get your administrators and your teachers and your parents on board. Show them the evidence. There's a lot of evidence. What I showed today was just a smidgen of the evidence. 
there's enough evidence to show you that it increases productivity, compassion in an organization. You get better organizational health. People work together better. They, they, they um, you know, anticipate problems. They're, they're, it's easier to get people through problems and easier to get people to work together. I, when I was in Northern California a few years ago, I was teaching um, mindfulness at a, a, a reservation school up in Klamath, um, um, California, on the Yurok Reservation. One of the things I did with the, these uh, U, uh, Yurok kids is I hooked them up with my students, my graduate students at Humboldt State University. I was teaching a mindfulness class, graduate class. So my graduate students would travel to the, to the classroom and do sits with the students and walks with the students and, and do that. So you hook your class up with other students. It's a, global, it's a global world we live in. No one should live in isolation. We should know what other schools are doing, what they're doing, and people that I've seen are more than happy to engage in a conversation and tell you what they're doing. Um, and the other thing, the final thing is give administration and teachers the language of neuroscience. Not just about mindfulness, give them the language of neuroscience. They should know all the parts of the brain that are affected, that are improved, that are corrected, that are changed structurally and functionally when people engage in mindfulness. That's not a hard thing to do. That's something Don and I are working on in our uh, Center for Mindful Decolonization. We're doing all these things. So, and we're doing it because we know it can make schools, organizations, communities better places. You know, that's what social work is all about, is to try to help people achieve a sense of justice, a, chance, a sense of, you know, connection with one another to begin to decolonize, you know, all of these harmful situations that people have gone for, through for long periods of time and to bring indigenous people and settlers together to work together on some of the common problems we have as humanity. So that's the thing is, you know, get them involved in understanding it's, it's way beyond mindfulness. It's a better world. You know, there are so many payoffs that, that happen with that. Mindfulness just is one step toward that, you know, achieving what we want to achieve as, as a human society. So. Okay, I'm just going to ask two more questions here. Um, the next one, also from a health-related uh, point of view, is this is a follow-up to one of the previous questions that you answered already, is I also find uh, it relevant, or mindfulness relevant, to obsessive, compulsive, and avoidant personality disorders. Can you please convey your opinions on this? Well, certainly there's uh, some work around uh, the similarities between addiction and obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, and there's a work done that was started by Alan Marlatt uh, called Urge Surfing. And it's the ability to pay attention to the experience of uh, the, the rise of So Don's frozen. Can you hear me? Yes. Hmm. Yes. There we are. Hear. Back oh, again. We are. I think we both disappeared this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, if you're interested, I would just look up that that work. Let me let me show you Thank a book you. That, I, that I used in in uh, one of my classes at the Humboldt State University in Northern California. So. Um, Sorry, it's by this, um, oops, Fabricio Diadana, who's the editor. It's a great, it's a clinical handbook of mindfulness. This is, this is a book that I used um, in, in my uh, MSW class when I was teaching, uh, getting my students to kind of learn more about mindfulness and then to begin to engage in uh, learning the practices and then eventually bringing it to their agencies. There's one book. So there's a lot of uh, really important conditions that a lot of really experienced uh, um, um, clinicians have worked with using mindfulness. This is another uh, person that I've used in classes too. Um, um, so her work, she's the editor of this is, uh, let's see if I can get the name up here, gosh. Um, Illuminating the Theory and Practice of Change. And this is by, um, um, what's her name, Barr, um, but, Again, it's assessing mindfulness practice, mindfulness and acceptance processes and clients. So there's, there's really a lot of really good accessible readings out there. Um, 
I'm not an expert, certainly in in, um, in um, uh, compulsive disorders, but I know that Diodonna's book has a whole chapter and a lot of uh, really good research on on uh, uh, compulsive disorders and the use of mindfulness and some very good research findings. So, very encouraging. And the final question is, could you please introduce effective methods of practicing mindfulness in, in the current circumstances, perhaps without having a trainer beside you? I'd love to speak to that. Right now, if you Google uh, mindfulness resources online, there are so many excellent, uh, some of the great teachers in the world are offering freely the experience of uh, having accompaniment. But, you know, I think one of the things I love most is short times, many times. Every single one of us is capable of actually pausing for a moment. There's a brief practice that I love. It's called the stop practice. The first letter is, uh, is an S, and we just stop whatever we're doing. The second, T, take a breath. The O is just observe what's transpiring within you what's transpiring around you. And the P is then proceed with just a little bit more clarity of what's called for in this moment. So wonderful uh, practice to use if you're home and parenting or you know, you're stuck in uh, quarantine with uh, your family and finding it just that your irritability is up a little bit. These are um, totally accessible and very useful. And the more times you stop, the greater the capacity that you'll have to actually access your wisdom and uh, respond rather than react to situations. Thank you. Yeah, not, not just second that too. I think um, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of um, the success that people have in in maintaining a practice, like Don saying, is to break it up. I mean. There's no reason for the way we live right now to try to crack. You know, to try to Put an hour here, an hour there, that it doesn't work. <clears throat> Especially when our brains have been sculpted to be on the alert all the time. And we have what they call the monkey mind. It's always sort of active. So I, I always say to folks, it's like, for me, it's like running or meditation. Is that if I, if I, you know, do short pieces, like, um, and I do all day, really do the same thing. Uh, do 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, 10 minutes there. By the time I've, I've ended, you know, my fifth time, it's 50 minutes during the day um, that I do it, but not every day. You know why? Because it's like running. You know, you don't have to do it every day. Once you begin to build the neural networks, they're there, right? And you, all you have to do is sort of help them bloom a little bit. Um, that's just how the brain works. So don't ever feel like, you know, if you can't do a half hour meditation that you failed, if you can do 30 seconds, you've succeeded. You've done 10 seconds, you've succeeded. And all you want to do is, you know, just to, you know, to increase that a little by little. So some people like the Buddhist, you know, Tibetan monks, these guys are the marathon, the ultra marathon people. They can do 10,000 hours, you know, in two years time or three years time or whatever it is. That's just not for most of us. Or they can go on retreats for 90 days. That's not for most of us. But the person that can be consistent by doing it you know, as much as they can every day are the people that are going to succeed, it's just like running or swimming or any other activity. There are thresholds. There are chemical thresholds that happen in the body. When you sit too long, you're going to raise levels of cortisol and it's going to be counterproductive. You don't want to do that. You want to sit long enough and practice until you, you know, until you reach a point like I can't do it anymore. Then you back away. It's like for me, I do high intensity interval training. I know when I run really hard for two minutes or five minutes uh, really hard. That's that's about the extent that I want to go, run a hard run. Same thing with meditation. I mean, I've meditated for hours, but I also have a threshold to know when I begin to lose, um, you know, the meaning and begin to lose the, um, the benefit to it after so many minutes. And then I'll just shut down, go upon my day, and then I'll, I'll do it again. That's how you get, the, for me, that's my own way of getting the most benefits out of it, so. Well, thank you very much. That is a wonderful way to end. So thank you, Dr. Gillibert and Don, for your very interesting and enlightening presentation and mindfulness meditation practice. I will definitely be using that stop approach that you mentioned, Don.
And thank you to all of you for participating this afternoon. We will be sending you a link to today's session, as well as a link to a survey where you can share your thoughts and feedback. Please do provide your feedback as it's the only way that we're able to improve. Uh, next week on May the 27th, our speaker will be Dr. James Ferguson. He's the Deputy Director of the Center for De Defense and Security Studies and Professor in our Department of Political Studies. And he will be speaking on the defense and security implications during a pandemic. So have a great week and please stay safe. Thank you.